and welcome back to part two of the video. We're gonna have a little bit more reading to do before we are done. And this is gonna be a shorter video than before. So continuing on and finishing off on the fourth uh, uh, sublime state, uh, upeka or equanimity. And we just have, we just have uh, three passages here and we're gonna go on. So make sure you check out the part one to this video and I'll make sure that the link is below where you will also find a link to the text. So go and check out uh, part one to this video and everything will be there. Okay. So we're reading. To establish equanimity as an unshakable state of mind one has to give up all persistent thoughts of mind, beginning with little things from which it is easy to detach oneself and gradually working up to positions and aims to which one's whole heart clings. One also has to give up the counterpart to such thoughts, all egotistic thoughts of self, bidding beginning with a small section of one's personality with qualities of minor importance, with small weaknesses on, uh, one clearly sees in oneself, and gradually working up to those emotions and aversions which one regards as the center of one's being. Thus, detachment should be practiced. I have a couple of flies around here. I think they're listening to the Dhamma with me. They're enjoying the warmth in the room because it's getting cold outside. And I just got a little bit distracted. They're pretty funny sometimes, those kind of flies. Okay, so let me just see here if I can get one of these. Hello. Come on. Okay, so this is something I sometimes do. I put the flies on my finger. That's so strange. And not really. If you just. If you, you see, they, this is my finger. And if you just. Very, very gently put your finger down to the fly, like this. Sometimes they fly away. But you saw, I got him on my finger. Maybe I can try this one as well. Maybe you want to try. I'm going to climb on my finger, Mr. Fly. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, they can understand meta as well, even flies. So, continuing on. Enough was playing with the flies. To the degree that to the degree we forsake thoughts of mind or self, equanimity will enter our hearts. For how can how can anything we realize to be foreign and void of a self cause us agitation due to lust, hatred or grief? The three poisons. Those are not actually the three poisons. The three poisons are known as greed, hatred, and delusion. So anyway. Thus the teaching of no self will be our guide on the path to deliverance to perfect equanimity. Equanimity is the crown and culmination of the four sublime states. But this should not be understood to mean that equanimity is the negation of love, compassion and sympathetic joy, or that it leaves them behind as inferior Far from that. Equanimity includes 
and pervades them fully as they are fully pervaded and as they just as they fully pervade perfect equanimity so equanimity pervades metta and, or love and compassion and sympathetic joy and love and compassion and sympathetic joy pervades perfect equanimity and that concludes the fourth sublime state and these guys are just going crazy and so now we're going to be reading about the interrelations of the four sublime states so how do they uh, connect together um, and how does it actually work um, because the Brahma Vihara is like um, a plane not not really a plane of existence but it is it's like a, it's like a very expensive car that takes you from one point to another and so how do they pervade each other and here we go the interrelations of the four sublime states How then do these four sublime states pervade and suffuse each other? Unbounded love guards compassion against turning into partiality. So that was unbounded love guards compassion against turning into partiality, prevents it from making discriminations by selecting and excluding and thus protects it from falling into partiality or aversion against the excluded side. Love imparts to equanimity its selflessness, its boundless nature, and even its fervor. For fervor too, transformed and controlled, is part of perfect equanimity, strengthening its power of keen penetration and wise restraint. Compassion prevents love and sympathetic joy from forgetting that, while both are enjoying or giving temporary and limited happiness, there still exists at that time most dreadful states of suffering in the world. It reminds them that their happiness coexists with measureless misery, perhaps at the next doorstep. It is a reminder to love and sympathetic joy that there, is, that there is more suffering in the world than they are able to mitigate. That, that after the effect of such mitigation has vanished, sorrow and pain are sure to arise anew until suffering is uprooted entirely at the attainment of Nibbana. Nibbana is the ultimate security, where there is no decline. As soon as you have had that experience, you know and see for yourself. Compassion does not allow. Nibbana is much, 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 much higher and much, much more refined and qualitatively better by billions of times than the four than the Brahma Viharas of the four sublime states. They have nothing on entering into Nibbana. Nothing. Enlightened beings don't really have to perform goodness because they're beyond good and evil in that sense. So that was a little bit on Nibbana. Continuing on. Compassion does not allow that love and sympathetic joy shut themselves up against the wide world by confining themselves to a narrow sector of it. Compassion prevents love and sympathetic joy 
from turning into states of self-satisfied complacency within a jealousy-guarded petty happiness. Compassion stirs and urges love to widen its sphere. It stirs and urges sympathetic joy to search for fresh nourishment. Thus, it helps both of them to grow into truly boundless states. Appamanya. Compassion guards equanimity from falling into a cold indifference and keeps it from indolent or selfish isolation. Until equanimity has reached perfection, compassion urges, urges it to enter again and again the battle of the world in order to be able to stand the test by hardening and strengthening itself. Sympathetic joy holds compassion back from becoming overwhelmed by the sight of the world's suffering, from being absorbed by it to the exclusion of everything else, and sympathetic joy relieves the tension of mind, soothes the painful burning of the compassionate heart. It keeps compassion away from melancholic brooding without purpose. From a futile sentiment, sentiment, boo, boo. from a futile, <laughs> from a futile sentimentality that merely weakens and consumes the strength of mind and heart. Sympathetic joy develops compassion into active sympathy. Sympathetic joy gives to equanimity the mild serenity that softens its stern appearance. It is the divine smile on the face of the enlightened one, a smile that persists in spite of his deep knowledge of the world's suffering, a smile that gives solace and hope, fearlessness and confidence. Wide open are the doors to deliverance, Thus it speaks. That means the doors to Nibbana or enlightenment, they are still open for anyone who dares enter them. As long as the Buddha Sasana is still around, the doors will remain opened. And as long as there are Arya Pukkalas, noble beings in the world, to uphold the Dhamma, the doors will not slam shut. And this is also, I think, a good reminder of why we shouldn't live our lives um, just positively going through everything and just every day waking up being positive, positive, and no matter what happens in our lives, we're just going to put some positive on it because positive doesn't change anything. And someone is riding on their bike and they uh, fall off the bike and they break their arm or they if they break their leg or they something happens to them and they're suffering it doesn't really help to go over to a suffering person who has broken his arm or his finger or whatever and just say like, you should just be positive. You should, I mean, you should just be positive. Put some positive on it. It doesn't really work that way. So, and I also recognize that there is a difference between optimism and positivism. Because optimism would be saying, oh, you know, there's one, he fell off his bike over there. And so I see that I have the chance to actually do something here. And so... Instead of weeping about it, I'm being optimistic at my own opportunity to help the person get back up or help the old lady cross the street. There is no light for it uh, or whatever it could be. That is the difference between the, like a passive positivism, which is like a, a disabling of humans, 
and to an active optimism in seeing, you know, what should be done at the right time and at the right place. So that was just um, some of my own thoughts on uh, people telling other people uh, to just stay positive because, you know, for the most part, people who tell other people to stay positive, they're horrible to be around. They're like empty shells. Anyway, just a fair warning on that because it uh, this text really reminds us of how positivism uh, without due uh, course, course or you know uh, positivism just as a defense mechanism how it is, it is disabling anyone who, who does who uses it like that so anyway continuing on here with the Dhamma Equanimity, rooted in insight, is the guiding and restraining power for the other three sublime states. It points out to them the direction they have to take and sees to it that this direction is followed. Equanimity guards love and compassion from being dissipated in vain quests and from going astray in the labyrinths of uncontrolled emotion. Equanimity being a vigilant self-control for the sake of final goal does not allow sympathetic joy to rest content with humble results for getting the real aims we have to strive for. Nibbana Enlightenment Equanimity, which means even-mindedness, gives to love an even unchanging firmness and loyalty. It endows it with the great virtue of patience. That's a true virtue. Equanimity furnishes compassion with an even unwavering courage and fearlessness, enabling it to face the awesome abyss of misery and despair which confronts the boundless which confront boundless compassion again and again. So it makes you really strong and awesome. It actually said here, Equanimity furnishes compassion with an even unwavering courage and fearlessness, enabling it to face the awesome abyss of misery and despair. Those are awesome things, right? <laughs> Which confront boundless compassion again and again. To the active side of compassion, equanimity is the calm and firm hand led by wisdom. Indispensable to those who want to practice the difficult art of helping others. And here, again, equanimity means patience. The patient, the patient, the patient devotion to the work of compassion. In these and other ways, equanimity may be said to be the crown and culmination of the other three sublime states. The first three, if, uncon if unconnected with equanimity and insight may dwindle away due to the lack of, the, of a stabilizing factor. Isolated virtues, if unsupported by other qualities which give them either the, need firm, the needed firmness or pliancy, often deteriorate into their own characteristic defects. For instance, a loving kindness without energy and insight, may, be, may easily decline into a mere sentimental goodness of weak and unre unreliable nature. Moreover, such isolated virtues may often carry us into a direction contrary 
to our original aims and contrary to the welfare of others too. It is the firm and balanced character of a person that knits isolated virtues into an organic and harmonious whole, within which the cinco qualities exhibit their best manifestations and avoid the pitfalls of their respective weaknesses. And this is the very function of equanimity, the way it, contrib it contributes to an ideal relationship between all four sublime states. We're getting near the end here. Kind of. One page left. If you're interested in that. But obviously you're watching the video, so you can probably see how long time there is left on the video. And so it would probably maybe be something like this. Let me see if I can guess it. So we were like that. So this is like, depending on how far. Is it like that? Is it is it like so? I don't know. Whatever way it turns. Okay, so just a small distraction, but we're getting towards the end. And continuing on. Equanimity. It's a perfect, unshakable balance of mind rooted in insight. But in its perfection and unshakable nature, equanimity is not dull, heartless or frigid. Uh, its perfection is not due to an emotional, emotional emptiness, but to a fullness of understanding. To its being complete in itself. Its unshakable nature is not the immov immovability of a dead cold stone, but the manifestation of the highest strength. In what way now is equanimity perfect and unshakable? Whatever causes stagnation is here destroyed. What dams up is removed, and what obstructs is destroyed. Vanished are the worlds of emotion and meanderings of intellect. Unhindered goes the calm and majestic stream of consciousness, pure and radiant, watchful mindfulness, sati, has harmonized the warmth of faith Satta, with the, pen, with the penetrative keenness of wisdom, Panya. It has balanced strength or, uh, of will, Virya, with calmness of mind, Samadhi, and these five inner faculties, Indriya, have grown into inner forces, Bala, they cannot be lost again. So, as I said earlier, maybe in the other part one video, there is no decline. We're talking about Nibbana again. They cannot be lost because they do not lose themselves anymore in the labyrinth of the world, samsara. In the endless dif diffuseness of life, Papancha, these inner forces emanate from the mind and act upon the world, but being guarded by mindfulness. They, they nowhere bind themselves and they return unchanged. Love, compassion, and sympathetic joy continue to emanate from the mind and act upon the world, but being guarded by equanimity, they cling nowhere and return unweakened and unsullied. I think that's a good point. Um, thus, within the 
Thus, within the Arahant, the liberated one, nothing is lessened by giving, and he does not become poorer by bestowing upon others the riches of his heart and mind. The Arahant is like a clear, well-caught crystal, which, being without stains, fully absorbs all uh, the rays of light and sends them out again, intensified by its concentrative power. The rays cannot stain the crystal with their various colors. They cannot pierce its hardness, nor, disturbs, nor disturb its harmonious structure. In its genuine purity and strength, the crystal remains unchanged. But as all the streams of the world enter the great ocean, all and all the waters of the sky rain into it. But no increase or decrease of the great ocean is to be seen. Even so is the nature of holy equanimity. Holy equanimity, or as we may likewise express it, the Arahan endowed with holy equanimity, is the inner center of the world. But this inner center should be well distinguished from the numberless apparent centers of limited spheres, that is, their so-called personalities, governing, uh, governing laws, and so on. All of these are only apparent centers because they cease to be centers whenever their spheres, obeying the laws of impermanence, undergo a total change of their structure. And consequently, the center of their gravity, material or mental, okay, so it is now more, but will shift. Um, but the inner center of the Arahant's equanimity is unshakable because it is immutable. It is immutable because it clings to nothing. Says the Master, For one who clings, motion exists, but for one who clings not, there is no motion. Where no motion is, there is stillness. Where stillness is, there is no craving. Where no craving is, there is neither coming nor going. And where there is no coming nor going, there is neither arising nor passing away. Where neither arising nor passing away is, there is neither this world nor a world beyond, nor a state between. This, verily, is the end of suffering. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. And that is the end of this text. And there's just one thing I would like to, before we finish the text, just read what I saw from the introduction. And so... Okay, so this is going to be my final thing. And so, thank you so much for listening, and I hope you found it interesting and awesome, and I hope that it made you inspired and feel awesome and amazing inside, and that you are now invincible, pretty much, you should be. And if you're not, make sure to check out part one and... So you can become completely invincible in the face of all suffering that life might throw at you. And on that note, let me just read a, little, uh, some, a few words of the Buddha from the introduction. And it goes, As the Mitta Sutta, the song of loving kindness says, When standing 
walking, sitting, lying down. Whenever he feels free of tiredness, let him establish well this mindfulness. This, it is said, is the divine abode. And may you and all beings in existence be well, happy and peaceful. Oh, we have three minutes. I thought we just had five seconds. So I can talk a little bit more. And so, yeah, but all I have to say is may you find true peace, happiness and freedom from suffering. And may you get to experience Nibbana for yourself so you can tell other people about it. Maybe, I think, Nibbana is like beyond words and beyond even goodness, and beyond even God. And so it might be hard to relay on other people. And so maybe this text will be of great benefit to you. And with that, have an awesome Saturday today on the 8th of October 2016 and I'm out. Peace.